And so Lisbon is a city of hills. You know, it, it's on uh, this huge river, they call it. It's really an inlet from the Atlantic Ocean. But it's on this, this huge inlet, and it's got, a, it's got hills all over it. Um, this is the, the Castillo that used to guard the entranceway to this river in the, uh, you know, the Middle Ages. And so that's one big hill. And then there's another hill here. And then this is a hill where people um, will go and they sit. There's little places to have your, you know, your sangria, whatever it is that you drink, and then look, at, look out at the city itself. So this is Lisbon from one of the famous hills. And this is just looking the other direction. It's an interesting mix. They've kept a lot of the old city around, but yet at the same time modernized it. And that's always a trick, is to keep some of the old character of a, of a city, and yet at the same time modernize it. And so you can see that there's modern stores here. And there's a, a street right along here that has you know, Gucci and Prada and all the, you know, all the expensive stores on there. And so, but there's still a lot of the old town here as you're coming up, especially up to the top of the big hills, they kept a lot of the old town intact. And then again, this is looking toward the inlet, the quote river they call it. And you can see that there's big freighters and, and ships come through. You can also take cruises on there too, but I'm not sure really what you see because there's not a whole lot to see on there. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about just general pathology in terms of the eye and also some inflammation and some of the just things that you'll need to know before we proceed on. And so whenever we're talking about the eye, it's very important that we have, that we have an understanding of where the eye comes from. And so embryologically, there are different parts of the eye that come from different layers, and they will help to explain some of the diseases that affect the eyes. And so it's important that you understand the embryology. And what's interesting is when you look at an embryo, especially the first four to six weeks, of a mouse, a chicken, a human, they all look exactly the same. And so they very much look the same. So these are um, embryos actually of mouse eyes. But one of the important things that you want to realize is that early on, this is the embryo, and this is the layer we're going to look at. Um, the eye will start by forming an outpouching of the neuroectoderm. All right, so neuroectoderm, the same thing that forms the brain that forms the neural tube is what forms a lot of the important parts of the eye, so neuroectoderm. Now, when you look at the, the pathogenesis of how the eye starts, basically, at four weeks gestation, this neuroectoderm will pooch out from the side of the developing embryo. As it approaches the surface ectoderm, it will induce a change, and the surface ectoderm will start to indent here and this neuroectoderm will thicken, and then eventually that surface ectoderm will push in and form the lens, and then the neuroectoderm will form the other you know, neural structures of the eye itself. So if you think about it, that is coming out, and think about it as a big balloon, and then somebody takes a fist and pushes it into that balloon, and it forms a bilayered cup. And so when you look at this, it forms this bilayered cup right here, and that's the neuroectoderm. All right, and this just shows um, you know, what, what comes from the neuroectoderm. The first and most important part is that that inner neuroectoderm forms the entire retina. So out of that single layer comes the entire retina, all the layers of the retina that you guys are gonna know about as we go through these lecture series. And so that inner layer is what forms the entire layer of the, of the retina. Now, the other thing that's important is while this is going on, you have to get blood in there. You have to get nutrients in there. You have to get um, materials in there to help this rapidly growing eye as it's forming. And so what will happen is you'll have a little fissure right here inferiorly. And in this fissure comes the hyaloid artery. So the hyaloid artery comes in, and the hyaloid artery branches out all the way around the lens itself and provides nourishment to that forming embryological eye. But it has a fissure where it goes in, and that's important because when that fissure closes off eventually, when that becomes a globe itself, there can be problems with the fissure closing that can lead to congenital anomalies. So again, an understanding of the embryology will let you know why these congenital anomalies occur. All right, so here's the first one. Uh, Lee. 
What do we see in here? So this is an external photo of what's probably the left eye. Um, <coughs> what you're looking at is the iris corbola. Okay. Imperially. And what, is, what do you think that represents? Uh, improper closure of the uh, chorda vein. Exactly. And so when you think about this, it starts at the equator and it's almost like a two-sided zipper that zips anteriorly and posteriorly. And so it's very rare to see a coloboma at the equator. But the anterior and posterior aspects of where that fissure closes decide where colobomas will form. So the anterior part of that fissure that stays open leads to a coloboma, and you see it's got that inferior location to a little bit inferior temporal and that just lines up with where that fissure is, and so that forms an iris coloboma. Okay, what does coloboma mean? Sorry. Sorry? Oh. Ah, in from what language? Greek. From the Greek, of course. From the Greek. Okay. All right. What are we looking at here, Nathan? All right, so again, we, you know, when, you're, when you're looking at something and you're not sure what it is, put it in the context of what we're talking about. So since we just showed an anterior part where the fissure doesn't fuse, obviously the next thing I'm going to show is the posterior part. Why? Because I'm OCD and I go from step A to step B. And so this is now the posterior equivalent of that choroidal fissure not closing. So this is what we call an optic nerve coloboma. Now sometimes it doesn't go all the way to the optic nerve itself, but Again, it's inferior here, and basically what you're looking at is just bare sclera. And so when that fissure doesn't close off, the retina doesn't form, the choroid doesn't form, and you end up with just a big piece of, of sclera sitting there. So this is called an optic nerve coloboma. So kind of the posterior um, extent when that fissure does not fuse. So posterior optic nerve coloboma. Now, other parts of, of the eye come from different layers also. And so we said that when the neuroectoderm pooches out and then hits the surface ectoderm, you end up getting an invagination of that surface ectoderm and that's what forms the crystalline lens. So the crystalline lens is actually comes from surface ectoderm. So it's different than other parts of the eye. So when you look at it, you'll see again, you'll get this invagination and eventually that surface ectoderm will pinch off and you'll get a cyst and then the cells from the back will grow forward and fill up that cystic cavity and make that solid lens. And this is important to understand how the lens develops throughout life. So when those cells leave that posterior part of the lens capsule and grow forward, after that time you normally do not have lens epithelial cells on the posterior surface. And so if you look right here, this is the way you remember them. They grow and they grow forward. So when the lens is growing throughout life, those lens epithelial cells that sit under the anterior lens capsule go around to the equator and then they fan out. And throughout life they send their fibers anteriorly and posteriorly, but they do not extend along the posterior capsule. So that's why you don't normally have lens epithelial cells in the posterior capsule. If you see them there, that's an abnormal situation. And here we just show you that again. These cells come around to the equator, they fan out in the equator and they send fibers both anteriorly and posteriorly. You can see the fibers here in the CM view. And so you normally do not have those fibers posteriorly in, in the lens as it grows. And this just shows again in the mouse eye, which is exactly the same as a human eye, that surface ectoderm comes out. Meet, I'm sorry, the neuroectoderm pooches out, it meets the surface ectoderm, the surface ectoderm pinches off, and when it does that, it causes that neuroectoderm to invaginate and leaving you a two-layered structure. All right, now, Josh, that neuroectoderm has now pinched off. It's a bilayered structure there. What parts of the eye does that neuroectoderm form? So 
We start yeah. anteriorly. What part would this form up here? This would be iris pigment epithelium. Okay, good. So the iris pigment epithelium, how do we tell that from pigment epithelium in other parts of the eye? What's the difference? Both layers of pigment. Exactly. So both of those layers on that posterior iris pigment epithelium come from those two layers of that neuroectoderm, and they're both pigmented. All right, Tara, the, inter, the intermediate layer, what is that form? The retina? Not quite, the intermediate, not the posterior. Um, I'm not sure. It forms the ciliary body epithelium. Okay, okay so it, the anterior part of that forms both layers of the iris pigment epithelium, and they're both pigmented. It also forms the two layers of the ciliary body epithelium. And how do we tell the difference between ciliary body epithelium and iris pigment epithelium? Ciliary body one's pigmented and one's not. Okay, which one is pigmented and which one's not? So here's how you remember it. The outer layer is the pigmented layer. Why? Because it's continuous with the RPE, which is also pigmented. So the outer layer is pigmented. The <coughs> inner layer of the ciliary body is not pigmented. And if you follow it all the way out to, you know, to the retina, it's continuous with the retina. And so the outer layer is pigmented, and then that is continuous all the way back posteriorly to the pigment epithelium. And then the inner layer is non-pigmented. It's continuous with the retina. And remember, the retina all forms from that one inner layer. Now, in terms of the, the hyaloid artery, we talked a little bit about what the hyaloid artery does, is it provides nutrients to the anterior part of the eye, especially the lens. And in fact, the hyaloid artery will form a whole net of blood vessels around the lens, and they call it the tunica vasculosa lentis, basically a vascular tunic, a vascular collar around the lens. And then, as the eye forms, this will regress. Now, there are some pathologic settings where it doesn't regress, and we end up getting a remnant. And so, Nico, what do we see in here? So we see the remnant of the hyaloid artery from the lens. All right, so you can see you've got this stock here, and it's coming forward, and there's the tunica vasculosa lentis. Now, by this stage in, in a development of an embryo, this should all have regressed. And so in this particular eye, it didn't. And so sometimes you'll see remnants of the hyaluronic artery when you look into the eye, even in an adult. And when you look anteriorly, this is the lens right here. This is posterior to the lens. Look at those little vessels there. So this is not regressed. These little vessels are still here behind that, that crystalline lens. All right, so we've, we wanted to talk. So on your embryology, you know, realize what layers different parts of the eye come from. So neuroectoderm gives you your pigment epithelium of the iris, your epithelium of the ciliary body, your RPE, and your entire retina. Surface ectoderm gives you your crystalline lens. Also gives you the epithelium of the lids, of the conge, of the cornea. Now the in-between structures of the eye, what they used to call mesoderm. You know, we were taught that that comes from the mesoderm layer, the middle layer, but as people did studies about 40 years ago and looked more carefully at this, they found that it's actually neural crest. So when you think of the tissue in the, inside the eye that you think of as mesoderm, it's actually neurocrest. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about inflammation. And this is, is a slide, I copied this from an old talk. This has got to be a fake slide because I've never seen a blood smear with all these blood cells on it. So it's got to be a fake. So this is a CNN <coughs> slide, you know, a fake slide. Come on, it's morning. Wake up, wake up here, come on, okay. <laughs> All right, so this has got pretty much every you know, type of, of white blood cell and red blood cell, for that matter, on here. So, Chris, 
What kind of cell are we looking at right here? The neutrophil. Neutrophil. And what's another name for neutrophil? Uh, or a full name for a neutrophil? Oh, uh, I want to say PMA. PMA. So polymorphoneutrophil. So it's the way you tell it is it's got multiple, you know, um, nuclei in it. And so it's got this several nuclei in it, PMN, and that's kind of your standard inflammatory cell. All right, so we've got some other inflammatory cells in here. Becca, this one's got kind of a bilobed, little heart-shaped nucleus. What is this cell? Uh, the one on the right looks like maybe eosinophil. And what makes you say it's an eosinophil? Uh, Exactly, so it's got all of those little eosinophilic granules, if you will. And so it's got granules that are in there, and so this is an eosinophil. People think of this as my, maybe a specialized PMN or an off branch of a PMN. All right, now, we've got another cell here which I've never seen in a path smear, and so I guess interns are, you guys are pimpable now, because you've been here for a while. All the pimples? What is that? cell right there. So that looks like a basophil. It's a basophil. And again, I've never seen a basophil in an eye smear. I mean, I'm sure there one somewhere, but you just don't see them. And these eventually give rise to the tissue mast cells. All right, now there's another one right here. Let's see, Shrav, you're hiding back there. What do we have here? Uh, okay, so this is a lymphocyte. And then, all uh, right, Tina, what are those right there? Platelets, and then lastly, we've got the red blood cells. So that's kind of a nice overview of a fake slide that's got all kinds of, of cells in it. I don't know how they did that. So let's talk about PMNs. Um, let's go back. Yes, we've, we've swung back your lead. What do PMNs do? They are pretty much the uh, white blood cells, uh, and they attack foreign bodies. All right, so these are kind of the cells that, that, that defend everything. I mean, they kill foreign material, they kill bacteria, they kill things that are coming in. And what's important to remember about these PMNs is they have granules within them, and these granules have materials in them that help to kill off foreign material. The second thing, though, is there's a lot of substances in there that attract other kind of cells. And so these are the cells that go in, you've got an infection, you've got a, something in there, they go in, they dump out their toxic contents, they kill it, and eventually they call in macrophages and other cells that come in and eat up kind of the, you know, the, the dogs of war that are left over there. So the problem with these is if you've got something in your skin, you know, the PMNs come in, they kill it, you know, it eventually scars over and it's fine, that doesn't cause any problems. If you've got this in your cornea, these can cause direct damage. So as these cells spill their contents, there's proteases in there, there's collagenases in there, and so these can cause real havoc in a cornea. They can lead to a cornea melt, they can lead to scarring, and so that's why treating, for example, a, a bacterial corneal ulcer is such an ophthalmic emergency. All right, what do we have sinophils to do, Nathan? <coughs> All right, so kind of the thing you want to remember about eosinophils is they tend to attack parasites. So when you see a whole bunch of eosinophils, you're usually thinking of some kind of a parasitic infection. And, boy, this doesn't really show it, but these are supposedly eosinophils, you know. Again, I don't see those much in ophthalmology, but usually they're a sign of a parasitic infection. All right, um, Josh, what do lymphocytes do? more chronic responses to or not bacteria, viruses, fungi. Okay. So they're more of a chronic response, not so much a, an acute response. So what we call chronic inflammatory cells. So they're involved in a, in a chronic immune reaction. What different types of lymphocytes are there roughly? I mean, just in the broad terms. Oh, like T cells? Exactly. You okay. can have T lymphocytes, and those can be subdivided into all kinds of cells, you know, killers, assist cells, helper cells, and B cells. And how are B cells a little different than T cells? Uh, 
they're cell mediated, so they act a little differently than T helper cells. Well, and the other thing is, what do B lymphocytes eventually form? Plasma cells. Plasma cells, which make? Antibodies. Antibodies, exactly. So that's how you remember them. And so when you look at them, plasma cells are a specialized lymphocyte. And there's a couple of ways that you can recognize them. The nucleus is often off to the side, so it's an eccentric nucleus. And then it takes up about a third of the cell, and then the, nu the uh, cytoplasm takes up the other two thirds. The other thing that's interesting is it's got this clumped chromatin, and people call this a wagon wheel. So you know those old wagon wheels you saw that, you know, the wagons coming across the prairie, they had the central axle and then the spokes coming out? That's kind of what these look like. And so you see this wagon wheel clumping. And basically these become antibody factories. They start making antibodies to, you know, to defend against various pathogens. And eventually, when they start making so many antibodies, they just get so swollen that they spit the nucleus out and they become a bag of antibodies. They call this a Russell body. So this is a sign of a really chronic, ongoing, smoldering inflammation, and eventually you get what's called a Russell body. All right, let's see. Tara, what do these monocytes do? All right, so a monocyte is, is in the blood, but once it gets out of the blood into the tissue, then it becomes a macrophage. And if you want to sound intelligent, you say it with a British accent. So you say, you say macrophage. And so it always sounds more intelligent if you, if you say it with a British accent. So, and now here again, I'm gonna insult people. I'm gonna create, you know, hostile work environment as opposed to a Southern accent, which, you know, you can be, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, but if you say y'all after it, it just doesn't really sound really cool. But British, you could be saying anything. You could be saying the dumbest thing ever, but if you say it with a British accent, it just sounds so intelligent. So if you really want to impress someone, you say macrophage. And, and I haven't figured out where centimeters comes from either. That's the other one. It's, it's three centimeters. I went, what is that? Is it British? Is it French? I don't know what centimeter even is. So when it becomes a macrophage, it means that it's extended into the tissue. And remember, macrophages are kind of the cleanup cells. And so they'll come in and they'll kind of clean up what's going on and try to help the initial part of the repair mechanism, of the healing mechanism. So they come from a, a blood-derived monocyte and then eventually go into the tissue and become a macrophage. All right, so this just shows you as the macrophages go out into the tissue, there are these cells that have these bigger nuclei, and they've got this pinker cytoplasm around it. So those are tissue macrophages. All right, now, there are some specialized macrophages, and eventually they go further down, they become epithelioid cells, and then they can become giant cells. So, Nico, tell us what the three types of giant cells are. Lyme-head cell is one of them, foreign body giant cell, and Teuton giant cell. Okay, exactly. And so I probably should take these, you know, off here because, I mean, it's obviously telling me what it is. So the Langhans type giant cell is what you think of as a giant cell. I mean, that's when you think about it as a giant cell. And it has the nuclei lining up around the periphery kind of in a horseshoe. And it's got the cytoplasm all coming in the center. And so a good example where you see these in the eye most commonly is something like a Chalazian. So this is a sign of a granulomatous inflammation when you see giant cells. And this is just another tissue view showing you these Langhans type giant cells. They've got lining up of the nuclei in the periphery. Now this is the second type, foreign body giant cell, and obviously it's well named because it takes care of foreign objects. And so inside the eye, you can see these, for example, around a suture. So you've got a suture in there chronically. They'll often have these little multinucleated giant cells around them. If you look at a foreign material in the orbit, for example, you've got a piece of tree branch in your orbit, you'll often get these foreign body giant cells forming around them. And they're different from the other giant cells in that they have these nuclei all jumbled up. 
but that's how you can tell it's a foreign body giant cell. And here you see, this is a suture. And look at this giant cell just kind of cupping around it. So it's almost like it just kind of surrounds this foreign material, tries to, you know, if it can't eat it, at least tries to wall it off. And then lastly, Teuton giant cells. These are really interesting. Chris, what, is, what the heck is a Teuton giant cell? Teuton giant cell. Uh, All right, so Teuton giant cell, they're, they're interesting because you have these round nuclei here, but you have this rim of this empty space. And so that is lipid. So these two-ton giant cells are really interesting because they have this rim of this lipid that's around them. Can you name one entity that we would see a two-ton giant cell in? Um, something with lipid, so maybe like a lipoma or something like that? Or? There's a specific entity we often see these in in kids. Exactly. So you see these two-ton giant cells in juvenile xanthogranuloma. You can often you can see them in adults too. Sometimes you get these um, lipogranulomatous inflammations in an adult too, and you can see those. So the key is they've got this this rim of lipids surrounding them. So it's like they've almost got a halo around them. So very specialized type of giant cell. Now, just like there are three, yes. Um, no, usually xanthelasmas are interesting. They're usually macrophages stuffed with lipid. And so a little bit different. So you've got three types of giant cells. Remember those. You've got three main types of granulomatous inflammation. And so when you think of a granulomatous inflammation, the first type is a diffuse granulomatous inflammation. And the um, example around the eye that we use of a diffuse granulomatous inflammation is sympathetic ophthalmia. So, Becca, what is sympathetic ophthalmia? So, uh, when you have uh, one eye that uh, is no longer seen due to optic nerve trauma or damage, um, the other eye develops a granulomatous reaction in response to that. Okay, so sympathetic ophthalmia, it's just what it says, it, it's an inflammation that occurs in sympathy to a severe trauma to an eye. So usually don't see them just with a minor trauma, but in a severe trauma, you will start to get an immune reaction, and then people have argued, is it a reaction to uveal antigens, is it a reaction to pigment in the eye, whatever it is that triggers it, then you can get a reaction to the other eye. And this was really first seen in World War I where you had you know, generals trained in the 19th century of you know, cavalry charges and people running across open fields against 20th century weapons such as machine guns. <coughs> and so patients in World War I would get these nasty shrapnel injuries in one eye and then they would go blind in the other eye from sympathetic ophthalmia. You know, now we've realized that if you've got a severely traumatized eye, you can prevent sympathetic ophthalmia by nucleating the eye within the first you know, 10 to 14 days. But we've also got immune medicines now that can treat it. Now, I'm trying to think pathologically. I don't think I've seen a synthetic ophthalmia in years. So very uncommon entity. But it is a good example of a diffuse granulomatous inflammation. And here you can see a different kind of granulomatous inflammation. Ha, I didn't write this down. So what's the second? type of granulomatous inflammation. Um, so you could have non-KC, which this is what this looks like. Okay, so what do we call the broad category of these, the second type of granulomatous inflammation? I'm not sure. It's called a nodular type. And the example that you are getting at is what disease is characteristic of this? Uh, sarcoid. Sarcoid, exactly. So people will call this a nodular or sarcoidal type of reaction. So you get these multiple nodules of inflammatory reaction. And if you look right here, you'll see that they do kind of form these nodules. And you've got these 
really bizarre looking giant, giant cells. I mean, vente giant cells, very, very big giant cells. So you can see them here. And so there are multiple nodules. And so this is called a sarcoidal. And TB fits in this too, although TB sometimes gets caseating, gets cheese-like, it gets rotten in the center of it. But this is the, the second type, a nodular type of granulomatous inflammation. This is the sarcoidal type. And you can even get these weird asteroid bodies, they call them, in the center of the um, giant cells. And I don't know, that kind of looks like a, I don't know, an amoeba to me, or an octopus. It doesn't look like an asteroid. But you get these weird inclusions in the center of the giant cells in, in sarcoid. They call them asteroid bodies. So that's sarcoidal. And then the third type is a focal or zonular type of reaction. And this, you know, the characteristic of, of this in, a, in an eye is when you had a ruptured lens capsule, um, traumatic or whatever, and then you get this, zon this zonular focal reaction around it. Pretty uncommon nowadays because we take care of ruptured lens capsules. We do surgery on eyes that have been traumatized. We do good cataract surgery. We don't do crude extra caps anymore. But um, Becoanaphylactic endophthalmitis was an example of, of this type of zonular um, reaction. We'll talk about that when we do the pathology of the lens. And here you can see, this is a patient, believe it or not, this was the cornea up here and this was iris and ciliary body. This is the lens that's been ruptured because of a severe trauma. This poor guy got kicked by a horse. So the horse kicked him right there. And you can see the lens capsule has been ruptured. Here's some lens cortical material. And when we look, yeah, when we look closer in here, we'll see this focal granulomatous inflammation. So those giant cells are in there trying to clean up that ruptured cortical material. So three types of giant cells, three types of granulomatous inflammation. All right, now, there's no other place to talk about this. So when you get an eye that's been kind of severely traumatized, it has certain reactions to it that I wanted to chuck in here. So, Rob, what are we seeing here? We've got an eye that's been cut in half sagittally. What do we see inside here? Yeah, it's even like, it's almost like crystalline. You're even seeing like sparkles when you shine the light in there. And certainly you've got a disruption of normal intraocular contents. They're all jumbled up and disrupted. So this eye has been severely injured. And when we look at it pathologically now, you mentioned here's the thick sclera. The sclera is really thick. Look at the shape. That's almost square instead of round. What does that tell you? All right, so this eye is tysical. So tysis bulbi, by the way, spelled with a P-H-T-H. -H. So physicist bulbi. So tysis bulbi is an end stage reaction to some kind of either severe insult, either a trauma, a severe inflammation, whatever. It is kind of the end result of an eye that's been so traumatized that it shuts down. So the first thing you get is, is you notice that the eye becomes square instead of round, and the sclera becomes real thick. That's a sign of hypotony. So if you take the pressure, intraocular pressure, on an eye that is, is gone into tysis, it will be zero, or, or certainly very low. And if you look right here in the choroid and the ciliary body, look at how thick that is. It's spongy. It's because that pressure is not pushing things out. So it's like the sponge has absorbed water and even gets thicker. So you see that this choroid gets really thick and spongy. Look at the disruption of intraocular contents. So intraocular contents are not normal. They're very disrupted in an eye that's tysical. Here you can see the thick sclera because the eye is hypotenuse. Sclera kicks on fluid. It gets really thick. And here you see the edema of the choroid. You know, as the pressure is zero, I said it's almost like a sponge that sucks up water. and It gets really thickened. 
Tina, what else can you see in severe tysis? What are we seeing right here? Um, so we're looking kind of beyond the cornea, and we're seeing some body. This is actually, this would be optic nerve back here, and oh, the retina is no. completely gone here. So this is along where the RPE used to be. Here's a close-up. It's even more than calcium. What is that? What kind of tissue is that? Cartilage? Even beyond that. Bone. Bone, exactly. So when you get an eye in the end stage, such as Tysis bulbi, the retinal pigment epithelium is a pluripotential cell. It can make all kinds of other cells. So it can become like a fibroblast, like an astrocyte, but when it is stimulated enough, it can start laying down bone. And so my technician, Mary, hates these because when she goes to cut these tysical eyes, she has her nice sharp, you know, her nice sharp blade and it goes, hits, hits bone. So she even has to decalcify these sometimes in order to cut them. And so you'll get along the RPE in the end stage bone. I mean, this is actually bone right here. So that's just the end stage reaction of, of an eye that's been severely injured or inflamed or whatever. So Tysis bulbi. All right, now, while I've got you all here, this is the only other time I can do this, this part of the lecture also. One of the things that, that oh, I love, here's a patellism that's a real bugbear to me, is the, I love that, bugbear is when we get a specimen from the OR without any information or without what you're looking for. So remember, it's, it's the old thing about garbage in, garbage out. If I don't know what you're thinking and what you want, I can't do the special stains or what you need to help. And so eventually you guys are gonna be seniors in the OR, you're gonna be sending specimens, you're gonna be working with people. I need to know what the history is and what you're looking for. So it doesn't do me any good when I get a specimen that says lid. You know, we want to know, okay, recurrent ulcerative lesion, rule out basal cell, or possible sebaceous cell or something. And so we need to know what you're looking for in order to help guide us to do the special stains that we need to do to help you. So if you are in the OR and you're planning on doing something special, call us ahead of time. By us, I mean the fellows too, or Mary or me. Call us and let us know what you're planning to do and we can guide you. Sometimes there's a setting where we'll need fresh tissue, where there's a setting where we'll need a special fixative, but we need to know that ahead of time. It doesn't help us after the tissue's already in formalin. And so communication is the key. If you're gonna do a biopsy and you want something special done, let us know, and that's really important. Now, the first thing is the requisition slip. Who usually fills that out? It's usually the nurse who fills that out. But I find that the more information we get on a requisition slip, the better we can help you to get the information you need. It. And this is where I really credit Dr. Patel. He writes on there himself. He'll put on there, Nick, chat with a non-healing lesion, rule out BCE, ta -bubi. Okay, so that's helpful to me. Or he'll draw a picture. He'll say, okay, lesion here, pigment here, and that helps us to align the specimen and to figure out what we're looking at. So, especially if you're looking at a tumor, you want us to look at margins, things like that, give us the information we need on the requisition form and we can help give you what you're looking for. Now, when you're doing ocular tissue itself, this goes without say, but you really want to be delicate on there. So every once in a while we'll be looking at a past specimen, we'll see all this purple mush on there, and that's what we call crush artifacts. So if you're have it really tight with a forcep and crush it, we can't tell what that tissue is. So be delicate. And if you're looking at something abnormal and you want us to compare to something normal, get a rim of normal around it if you can. That's always really helpful for us to see that. And then make sure it gets fixated promptly. Don't let it sit out for, you know, the weekend overnight before it goes into fixative because then the tissue breaks down. Now the most common fixative we use is just 10% neutral buffered formalin. And that is the vast majority of specimens. However, if you want electron microscopy, which is rare nowadays, we don't do much EM, but that has to have a glutaraldehyde based fixative. So if you're gonna do EM on a specimen, again, let us know ahead of time. If you need fresh tissue, 
or stains that require fresh tissue, let us know because we need to freeze that ahead of time. And so we can do that fresh. So when you put the specimens and you want to say you have a fresh tissue, you say, okay, I want this done fresh. Don't just put it in the jar dry. Don't put it in a jar filled with saline because it'll get all macerated. What you do is you put some saline on a four by four or on a wet cell or whatever to moisten it and then put the tissue on that and then put that in the, in the jar. Now, say you guys are finished with your residency and you're going out and you just started your practice in Missoula, Montana so that you can you know, cross country ski and you decide you're gonna send me a specimen you can actually put the specimen on ice in a chest and send it FedEx and it'll keep it good for 24 hours. But the key is put it on a saline soaked gauze. Don't put it in a jar of saline. Don't put it on a dry gauze. Put it on a moistened gauze and then close the container and then put that on ice. Now conjunctiva is a special material. If you take off a piece of conjunctiva, it rolls up into a ball. So if we're concerned about a tumor, of the conge, we really want that to be laid out so that we can look at the margins and look at the edges and not make it rolled up like a ball. So what I find is, is you know the little cardboard on your gowns when you spin your gowns? That's perfect. So if you want to do a conjunctiva specimen, take that cardboard that you know, you've spun your gown with, cut about a little two by two centimeter piece of it, use the non-shiny surface and lay the conge out on that and let it sit there for about a minute and it'll stick. And then just float the whole thing in the formalin and we'll leave it on there until my tech has a chance to process it. So when the fellows look at it, they'll actually look at it on the cardboard and then we'll run it through processing stuck to the cardboard. And you can actually orient the margins by cutting notches in the cardboard. So you wanna say, okay, one notch is temporal, two notches are superior. I've seen people try to pin stuff to specimens, that doesn't work because the pins fall out. I've seen people put a, just an ink dot on them. Well, the formalin dissolves ink. So unless you have a special ink, that doesn't work. So I think this works the best. Now, if you've got a piece of lid, you can put a tiny suture through it if you want, and that'll help us orient it too. So this is what I'm talking about. Here's a little piece right here. We lay it out onto the surface. We let it dry. We cut a notch. Okay, this is temporal. This is the right eye. Then we can have my tech cut it through and we can actually assess your margins for you. So this is really helpful to us. All right, a couple of things I want to talk about and then we'll be done today. Stains. Okay, let's see, we went, I think you did, who did the last real one? Oh, Tina did, okay, back to Lee. Now I'm gonna do this randomly so you guys can't game up by trying to sit in the back. I'm gonna start in the back one of these days, so. <laughs> We've got several different stains we use in ophthalmology. And Lee, what is the most common stain we use? This is an example of it. Um, it's a, it's a stain. Uh, Actually, H&E. Uh, H&E, exactly. So, <laughs> so, you know, the problem is, is you always know the answer to every question except when the spotlight hits you. And it's, I don't know if it's, if it's the stress hormones or what, but as soon as that spotlight hits you, man, that iron curtain just goes shunk and your brain stops working. Lee, what's your name? Uh, uh. <laughs> so don't worry, that's normal. The reason I use this format for you guys is, you know, you're going to have to take oral boards eventually to, to you know, be boarded in ophthalmology. Man, people's brains shut down when they're questioned, so that's why we do this format. So this is an H&E stain. This is our standard stain, hematoxyl and eosin. So these you remember, hematoxylin is blue and eosin is, is pink or red. So this is our standard stain. When you think of a histopath stain, here's a cornea, you've got the epithelium, the stroma, you've got these blue inflammatory cells here, you've got the red blood vessels. So this is our standard bread and butter H&E stain. We do this on the vast majority of specimens that we get. Okay, Nathan, what kind of stain is this? Uh, red stain. This is like house stain, isn't it? Yep. First of all, what kind of tissue are we looking at? This 
cornea. No, this is light pink. This is dark magenta. What stain is this? This is PAS. And what does PAS stand for? PAS chip, it is for... Um, Why would I show you this picture of the cornea to talk about this? It stains basement membranes. And so the reason I'm showing you this, if you look, this is the corneal epithelium. This is Bowman's layer, non-staining. This is the basement membrane of the epithelium staining that bright magenta color. So this really highlights the fact that the epithelial basement membrane is not Bowman's. And Bowman's is not the basement membrane. So this is a PAS stain. It stains basement membranes. So chance to save yourself. What part of the cornea is indeed a basement membrane? Not, uh, decimate. not, not Bowman, but decimates. But decimates, exactly. So decimates would pick up. So this is kind of the second probably most common stain we use, the PAS, staining for basement membrane. And another part of the eye that's really thick basement membrane is the lens capsule. So if you're looking for lens capsule, you could do a PAS stain also. All right, what kind of stain are we looking at right here, Josh? Blue one. It's a blue one. That's man, you guys are you guys are on the ball, man. Sharp. So something in the cornea. Is this something something in the cornea and the cornea stroma? Okay. So what do we use that's got blue and cornea stroma? Kind of stains collagen, maybe. Not quite. Some kind of organism that's in the cornea? Nope. Nope. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Collins. It's part of, a, part of a mnemonic that we memorize when we're looking at corneal stromal dystrophies. Okay, Alcyon blue. Alcyon blue. And what does Alcyon blue stand for? Granular? Is that... Okay, so. There's a mnemonic when we're going to do the cornea, the cornea dystrophies. And don't memorize it now, but you will then. Marilyn Monroe really always gets her man in LA, California. So Marilyn macular, Monroe mucopolysaccharide, really recessive, always alcyon blue. So alcyon blue stains for mucopolysaccharide. So this is an alcyon blue stain of the cornea staining the mucopolysaccharide. So this is a macular dystrophy of the cornea. And we'll go over this when we do cornea in about four weeks. All right. Tara. Um. So again, I'm OCD. We're going right down the list here. What's next? This is trichrome. All right, so Masson's trichrome stain. And what does it stain? All right, so granular, her, and her. Hyland, exactly. So this is a massage trichrome stain, and it stains Hyland material, that pinkish color. It also stains epithelium pink. It stains connective tissue like stroma, cornea, sclera, blue. Okay. And the third one, Nico? Uh, Congo red. Congo red. And what does it stain? Amyloid. Amyloid. So LA, California, lattice, Congo red, amyloid. Now, this does not happen to be a lattice dystrophy. This is actually amyloidosis. And so amyloid will stain with Congo red. And I always tell people, maybe, you know, supposedly males are colorblind, which our spouses always tell us as we say, oh, that's gray. They say, no, that's not. So this is actually Congo red. That doesn't look red to me. That looks more orange. You know, I don't know. What do you guys think? It looks orange to me rather than red. So red orange. Nectarine. Okay, it's, it's, it's nectarine. All right, so 
Congo red stains amyloid. Chris, what are we selling here? Is this a uh, um, GMS? Uh, silver, that sort of thing. You no, know, this is kind of a weird look here. If you look at it, it's kind of lit up here, almost like it's lighting so up here. Fire fringes? Exactly. Okay. This is the other property of amyloid is if you put two polarized filters on there and cross them with the Congo red stain, you will get birefringent. So this is a amyloid, this is a lattice dystrophy amyloid in the cornea, and we've now crossed the filters and taken a picture. So this shows the birefringence that you get. Becca, what kind of stain we see in here? Okay. Yeah, it looks like some yeasty beasties on here. So what kind of uh, stain do we do for those little yeasties? GMS. GMS. So it's, it, you know, and the initials you can memorize, but, but remember what they are. Gamori methenamine silver. So it's a silver stain. So it stains the fungi in a silvery color. So GMS, Gamori methenamine silver. All right, what kind of stain is this? Again, we'll pimp our interns here. I know you thought you thought you were safe, but you're not. Um, so it looks like we're again staining for some sort of organism. Uh huh. Um, it looks like there's some silver in there as well. You look these kind of round, almost yeah. cystic looking things. And of course there's these regular lamellae of collagen around them. So I'll give you a hint, this is corny, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what the name of the stain these is. These are acanthamoeba cysts. And so the stain we can do just with a normal microscope is called a gridley stain. So this is a stain. Now the reason we use this now, acanthamoeba lights up with you know, fluorescent stains and things, but I don't have a fluorescent microscope in my clinic. So we can use the Gridley stain, and the Gridley stain will stain the acanthamoeba cysts especially. And so this is called a Gridley stain. I just love Gridley. I mean, Gridley should be like the butler in an English movie. Shouldn't it be, Gridley, bring tea. Yes, sir, you know, tea, here you go, sir, you know. So Gridley, the English butler stain. So the Gridley stain, all right, so that stains acanthamoeba. All right, uh, Shrav, I guess we're to you. What are we looking at here? Cornea. Cornea? Kind of a blue stain here, especially in the base of the epithelium. Could be iron. Very good. And what does the what is the name of the iron stain? Prussian blue. Prussian blue. And how do we remember that? Prussian. Prussians, exactly. So who were the Prussians? The Prussians were the German militarists, you know, in, in the in the First World War. And, and so when you think of Prussians, you think of iron, you think of tanks and guns and cannons and things. And so Prussian blue stains iron, and that's how you remember it. This just happens to be an iron deposition in the cornea. So there are diff many different iron lines that can form from iron deposition in the cornea. So this is Prussian blue. Tina, what are we looking at here? So again, we're looking at cornea, but we're looking now at the other side. The deeper part. The deeper part. Um, and I see a red, splotchy stain in the stroma. This is the name of a stain that's, that describes exactly what it is. Hint, this is a fresh frozen piece of tissue. Okay, this is a stain for lipid and it's called oil red O. And the reason you remember it, it stains oil red Little O's, and so this, all right, here we go. 
little O's of oil that are stained red. And so the problem is, is that oil will leach out when you do your normal histopathologic processing. So when you put it in xylene and you put it in other things, it sucks the oils out of there. So on a normal formal and fixed tissue, the oil gets sucked out and it leaves empty spaces. Whereas if you want to do an oil stain, you have to have fresh tissue. So this happens to be, believe it or not, just a cornea that had been done years ago. We just did this for fun for research. This is an Arcus senilis. So this is just the, the, you know, the lipid deposition that forms that peripheral arcus you get. And so oil red O, it stains oil red O's. So that's how you remember it, oil red O. Okay, enough of the stage. So now here's the Castillo again on top of the hill in, in Lisbon. And so you see the old city. I mean, these are narrow, steep streets. It's all stacked up in here. So we'll go back to that. So for some reason, I'm not lecturing next Tuesday. I don't know why. But so then Tuesday, whatever, December 5th, um, lid. So read your BCSC book chapter on lid. And we'll go over all of the different lid pathologies. Questions in two minutes. OK, good. So. Today I talked an awful lot because this was just kind of an intro. Um, next Monday I'm going to talk a lot less. I mean, next I'm sorry, week from Tuesday I'm going to talk a lot less, and you guys are going to talk more. Okay? Yeah. All right. Very good.